I think so, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, what's up everyone? Uh, my name is Dr. Darsh. Uh, I just wanna thank Web Shadowers um, for bringing me on here. This is a really awesome experience. I hear there's a lot of you out there. So this is gonna be uh, super awesome. Uh, I'm a first year intern. So I'm a intern resident at Penn State Hershey completing my residency in physical medicine and rehab. So essentially I'm gonna take you guys through a case first, um, something that delves into PM&R and that might be something that you guys probably don't know too much about. You know, it's, it's not something that's really taught that much in med schools. So I'm happy, you know, more than happy to kind of give you guys some exposure here. And then after that, I think we're going to do some Q&A where I can, you know, really talk and delve into what PM&R truly is and the things that you'll see. So let's go ahead and get started here. So this case, um, I actually saw a patient last year when I was doing an audition rotation at Temple um, University. So I was a VCOM student, a fourth year, doing my audition rotations. So this was, I think I saw the patient last September. So let's get started. So HPI, right? So whenever the patient comes in, you always just want to get the history first thing, right? So here it's um, a 21 year old uh, right-handed female um, is suffering, or she had a right insula arterial venous malformation, status post rupture of intracranial hemorrhage at 12 years old, which resulted in a shunt placement and gamma knife resection. She now has a history of seizures. Her last one was March 24th, 2019. She has chronic migraines and headaches now, and she has left hemiparesis as well as spasticity and tone. She's followed by Temple University um, Neuro and Neurosurgery, and she has also completed a course of physical therapy and occupational therapy. Okay, so let's break that down. I know you know you guys may have what the heck does that even mean? So, 21 year old female, right? So pretty young, um, dealing with an arterial venous malformation. So what is that? So if you look down at that uh, picture on the bottom left it's pretty much an entanglement of the capillaries where the arteries and the veins meet. So hopefully you guys can see my cursor. I'm not sure if you guys can, um, but you can see the red artery and the blue yeah. vein. You guys can see it? Okay, perfect. Um, so right around here, right? That's the arterial venous malformation. It's a malformation in these capillaries that get tangled. And then she got um, a shunt placement, right? So an intracranial hemorrhage. She had bleeding in, in her brain. Um, because this arterial venous malformation ruptured, right? And so essentially she got a shunt placement here where they take some of the fluid and drain it all the way to your abdomen. And then this picture right here in the middle is a gamma knife resection. So you kind of go under what almost looks like, you know, like a CT scan, MRI. Um, and then they pretty much put beams of radiation um, to the specific location where they want to resect it. And then let's go on to the next slide where I can explain a little bit more about hemipresis, spasticity, migraines, all that different stuff. So, okay, so again, more with the history. So she's complaining of a trembling left leg, which makes it difficult, her, difficult for her to ambulate. She fell down the last two steps at church a few weeks ago due to activation of a left foot trembling, resulting in no serious injuries. She says that she's a fast walker and can be clumsy at times. Okay, so here I have a picture of hemiplegia versus hemiparesis. So these are kind of words that a lot of people get confused. So when you're dealing with hemiplegia, think of a, you know, it's a paraplegic. So these people have no function in that arm or that limb. In this case, this young woman has hemiparesis. So she has very limited function in her left arm and left limb. It's still not fully functional, but as you'll see, as we go on with the physical exam, um, it's, it's very tough for her to kind of move it and have function. And then the other things you really want to take away from here are, hmm, okay, so she has a trembling left leg. So that's making it hard for her to walk and function. Um, and then she fell down the steps. So it's kind of thinking, well, why is she falling? And then why is she being clumsy at times? So that's kind of what we got to keep in the back of our minds here. Okay, so past medical history, right? Very important to ask every single patient because this can really draw you into certain clues. So um, her past medical history, so she had an arterial venous malformation, she had brain aneurysm, she's got a migraine, she's got hydrocephalus, right? Which is like increased pressure uh, inside the cranium and then epilepsy. And then her past surgical history, she had a CSF shunt, which we just talked about, and a craniotomy clipping. So that's essentially what you would do for an aneurysm. You, uh, aneurysm is something, it's like an outpouching of an artery wall. And essentially you can clip that so that it wouldn't burst um, and start bleeding. 
So family history here, uh, her mother has depression, hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol and arthritis, and her maternal aunts have brain aneurysms. She actually had two maternal aunts with brain aneurysms. So it's pretty interesting. I've actually never met somebody with a family history of brain aneurysms. And then social history, also very important, right? So you want to find out, do they smoke? Do they do any drugs or alcohol? Are they sexually active, right? Because these are all things that can contribute to comorbidities, right? As you guys hear with COVID, right? It's obesity, smoking, drinking, all these kinds of things. So in this case, knowing if she's a smoker, knowing if uh, she does drugs, this might help us clue into, is she compliant with medication? If we tell her to do something, is she gonna be able to do it? So medications that she's on, she's on hydroxyzine, this might be you know, to help her sleep, um, Keppra, which is a seizure drug, linaclotide, Paroxetine, which helps with depression, pyramate, which is also a seizure drug. So she's on a lot of seizure drugs here. Allergies, no known drug allergies, and then functionally, right? This is where PM&R, it really matters, right? Because our goal as PM&R doctors is to really make the patient functional. So figuring out how they live at home, what are the things that they're able to do? Um, you know, kind of almost just picturing it and getting every single detail so that we can help the physical therapist out, the occupational therapist out, the speech therapist out that work with us. So functionally for her, she lives in a two-story home. She's unemployed and she's out of school right now. Uh, she's moderately in, uh, independent to fully independent for her activities of daily living. So ADLs are things like showering, bathing, um, writing your bills, like things like that, cooking. So activities of daily living. And she ambulates without an assistive device. So even though she has this left hemiparesis, right, where she's not really functional with her left leg or left arm, she still can walk without an assistive device. So that's very interesting. And she does not drive, right? Kind of makes sense, has a history of seizures and stuff. Um, probably not safe also with that left hemiparesis. Okay, review of systems, right? So this is essentially going from head to toe and asking a lot of yes or no questions. So generally we ask, do you have chills? Do you have a fever? Do you have any type of weight loss? None for her. H-E-E-N-T, right? So head, uh, ears, eyes, neck, and throat. No visual problems, no ear pain, no congestion, no sore throat, cardiovascular, no chest pain, no syncope, right? Chest, no coughing. Uh, GI system, no nausea, no vomiting, no diarrhea. GU system, no urinary or bowel incontinence. Musculoskeletal, right? This is, boom, this is what we need to focus on. She has positive tone on the left side of the body as well as muscle weakness. So how can you have both, right? A lot of people might think, so what is tone, right? Tone is if you're essentially lifting a weight and you have your bicep, right? You increase that tone. So she essentially has her muscles shortening on the left side of her body, but because she's unable to get out of that, right? So normally you have um, tone and then you can relax it, right? And you can have tone again and then relax. And that allows you to have uh, functional muscles. But when your muscles become weak, it's because you can't shorten or, or lengthen that muscle. So for her, she has positive tone, but also weakness. Neurologically, she has gait problems, right? So she can't walk in a, you know, like in a, in a, in a normal way that we all can probably or imagine that we can. Um, and she also has some weakness when walking, but she has no dizziness. Skin, no rash. So what's our problem list, right? So I'll let you guys think about it for a few seconds here. Kind of just think about what are the problems that we are dealing with here. Um, think about some differential diagnoses in your head. Uh, think about her history. Think about her past medical history. So I'll let you guys kind of sit on that for a little bit. Okay, so number one, right? Her left hemiparesis, like that is a big thing in her story. And then she's also complaining about these tremors um, as well. So that's something we need to investigate. Number two, increased tone and spasticity on the left, right? She has an unstable gait. There's arteriovenous malformation, at least a history of it. She has a history of seizures as well migraine and headaches. Oh, and then I think the last one was here, uh, social impairment, right? So we always have to think socially in physical medicine rehab. Again, we're trying to optimize people's lives here. So it's not just about the medicine. Medicine also incorporates the art, the, like the art of it, right? You guys always hear the art of medicine. This is essentially what it is. It's also looking at social impairment. She's supposed to have an orthotic probably, but she does, but she ambulates without a device. So that's interesting. We have, to, we have to really look into that. And then um, she's out of school right now as, you know, as a 21 year old. Okay. 
So let's go over spasticity, right? So it is a very complicated picture here, but essentially what I'm just trying to let you guys know here is that spasticity is a loss of inhibition of your muscle, right? So when you think of someone spastic, you think of a spastic muscle, spasms, right? The tightening, tightening of your muscles. So again, if we look at the bicep, our bodies right now have a normal resting tone of all our muscles, right? When we sit, our postural muscles get contracted because we need to sit up. And we do this without thinking. But even when we sit, maybe our gluteus maximus or butt muscles, they kind of just relax, right? But the minute we get up, the gluteus maximus can uh, start to contract. So think about it that way, that normally in humans, we, if, you know, if, if you don't have any of these issues, neurological issues, you have normal resting tone. In spasticity, you lose that inhibition of relaxing it. So all it is is that muscles contracted um, and shortens, and there's no way to really lengthen that muscle out so that it can relax. So that's essentially what this picture here is showing. Um, what's interesting is we actually don't know the true reason for why spasticity occurs. We understand that it's an upper motor neuron lesion. We understand that, you know, there's a lot of these muscle fibers at play, but the true, true reason for behind all of it, we actually don't know yet. Okay, so vital signs, right? So always gives us a good picture about what's going inside someone's body, right? So the vital signs are temperature, respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate, um, oxygen saturation, and then pain used to be one. So in her, all of her uh, vital signs look great, right? 98 temperature, fantastic. 12 respiratory rate on the lower end, but good. Blood pressure 110 over 77, perfect. Heart rate 78, awesome. And we, you know, we didn't get her oxygen, but she wasn't wearing an oxygen mask or a nasal cannula or anything like that. So physical exam, again, for PM and R, this is our bread and butter. We have to be able to do a very good musculoskeletal physical exam. So generally, right, whenever you do a physical exam, you always want to bring up, how does the person look? Are they in distress? Are they not in distress? Are they anxious? Are they not anxious? Things like that. Are they disheveled? Do they look groomed? So for her, she was well appearing. She was not in any acute distress. Her skin was normal. Her head, ears, eyes, neck, and throat exam, normocephalic, atraumatic. So no injuries to the head. It was normocephalic and atraumatic, no trauma. Um, E-O-M-I, so extraocular muscles intact. So she was able to move her eyes everywhere. Her hearing was decreased on the left though. And that probably makes sense because of her um, stroke, right? The AVM that she had. Cardiovascular, cardiovascularly, regular rate and rhythm, normal S1 and S2 heart sounds, no gallops, no murmurs. Lungs, completely fine as well, right? Clear to auscultation bilaterally. Abdomen was soft, non-tender. You could hear bowel sounds, which is a good sign of, you know, not having constipation. And ne neurologically, AO times three means alert and oriented times three. So whenever you're trying to figure out somebody neurologically, right, who might have altered mental status, there's three things we really ask them. Do you know your own name? Do you know where you are? And do you know the time, the month, the year, whatever it may be? I always like to ask a fourth question just to understand awareness. And, some, and often I'll ask, if it is snowing outside and, and uh, presuming you're in North America, what season would it be? right? And the answer would be winter. So I always try to assess for awareness and I would say AO times four at that point. And then cranial nerves two to 12 are pretty much, you know, the functions of your eyes, your tongue, swallowing, hearing, smelling, things like that. So that would be cranial nerves two to 12 are all fine in her. Okay, so here we go. The musculoskeletal physical exam. This is what we do as physiatrists. So gait and transfers, right? So we, we're going to ask her to walk back and forth for us. So as she's walking, she has left hip hiking, circumduction, and initial contact at forefoot with poor clearance. What does that mean? I have a video on the next uh, slide, I believe. So I'll wait to show you guys that. Uh, alignment. So if she was standing properly, how does she look? Okay, pretty neutral, pretty symmetrical. Let's go to her arms and her extremities, her legs. So there was no muscle atrophy, right? She wasn't losing any muscle mass. There's no fasciculations. Um, her active range of motion was intact in the shoulder and elbow. So she was able to actively move um, her, her joints, but she had increased tone throughout her left upper extremity and left lower extremity. And what mass means is modified Ashworth scale. So that's essentially a scale we use to see how much spasticity there is. It's a scale from zero to four. A two plus is pretty much in the middle, meaning, um, when you move it, you will, you will get a catch and it'll be tough to really uh, lengthen that muscle and that spasticity out. 
And then here in this little chart, this is manual muscle testing, right? So what, uh, you guys might've seen this, you, asked, you guys have probably done this when you go to the doctors. Put your arms up, all right, push against me, push against me, push away, push away, do it with your legs. So that's essentially what we're uh, examining here. So a five out of five, <coughs> excuse me, is normal strength. So you can see on her right side, she has completely normal strength, five out of five for her shoulder, her extensions of her wrist, her fingers, all that. But on the left side, she has pretty much fours and then her wrist is a two. So she really has um, muscle weakness in wrist extension. Okay, so functional strength testing, right? So how, how well do you use your strength in a functional setting? So eating, things like that. So she's unable to use volitional wrist flexor tenodesis for grip. What does that mean? I have a video to explain that as well. And then lastly here, we always wanna do a neuro exam as well, well, right? So seeing sensation. So she has some dysfunction to light touch in all of her dermatomal and peripheral nerve distributions in her left upper extremity. So what a dermatomal pattern is, is pretty much a pattern in your body, a line in your body that aligns with the different nerves in your back, right? So different spinal nerves. So uh, like C7, C8, T1, T2, T3, T4, going all the way down, they each have their own distribution pattern. And so for her in her left upper extremity, she's having some dysfunction of light touch. So if you were to actually touch her, her, touch her arm lightly here and touch it lightly on her right side, she would feel a difference. Um, she also cannot, um, uh, discern vibration, light touch, um, or, or discrimination, which means uh, you do like two pencils and you try to see like, hey, can you figure out if there are two objects on you or one object on you? But she can feel temperature and deep pressure. Okay, now we look for reflexes, right? So this is where the reflex hammer comes out. You put it on your knee and you bang it and your knee goes jerking, right? So um, for her, a two is normal. A two out of four means you have normal reflexes. Now you can have hyporeflexia or you can have hyperreflexia. For her, upper motor neuron syndromes usually result in hyperreflexia. So as you can see here, her left, everything on the left side is either a three or higher. But then when you get to the Achilles, right? So you, you, you go to the ankle and you tap it and you see the foot go down. It was at a four. It went down really quickly. And so if you see here in the asterisk, I say, Clonus was elicited um, at left ankle. Patient states, that's my leg tremble. So if you guys remember from the history, she's complaining of a trembling leg. Boom, light bulb goes off. Now we know what it is. It's clonus. And what clonus is, is a repetitive movement of extension and flexion of a muscle. <clears throat> and so you can really just kind of uh, set it off. It's an upgrade from spasticity, essentially, right? So She's, she, so for example, let's take uh, spasticity in your wrist, okay? So right now my wrist is spastic. I can't stretch it back to normal. So clonus would be back and forth like this. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this. When I used to run track back in the day, uh, when I was dehydrated, my calves would actually just go under like clonus and just start shaking whenever I was like super dehydrated. So if you guys have ever had that experience, that's kind of exactly what clonus is. Um, and then we assess for upper motor neuron size. So she has positive Hoffman's reflex on the left. Hoffman's is essentially something where you can like flick the thumb and you'll see like some of the other fingers kind of move. Um, and then she has increased tone and clonus to that left ankle. Again, this is part of an upper motor neuron syndrome, which makes sense for her given her um, arterial venous malformation and uh, stroke. Okay, so here are the videos that I was talking about. So if you guys remember when I said that she was walking, um, she had a hip hike, circumduction, and four foot contact. So what does that mean? I got a video here to show you guys. So hopefully this thing loads. Hip hike. Patients with a drop foot or a stiff knee may hike up the ipsilateral pelvis in order to have the foot clear the floor. And this is known as the hip hike gait. So as you can see, he's got to move, because he can't lift his foot up properly and step like a normal, you know, with a normal foot, he's got to lift his hip up, go in a circle called circumduction, and then he lands on the front of his foot. Okay, so that's important to know. And then what were we talking about when we said tenodesis, wrist flexor, what is, what is all that? So 
Here's a, here's a cool video about how right, patients so with spasticity can actually bottle, use forks and spoons and, and um, open water bottles. There's a couple of ways of picking that up. You can just mm -hmm. use your wrists and, or um, fingers and hands to just grab it like this, and you can lift it up. Um, or if you um, want, you can try and use the tenodesis that I showed you to uh, pick it up. So if you want to do that, you got to put your hand down in the wrist flexion mode. and um, Put it like this and pick it up like this so you can see that my wrist is in the flexor mode right now um, grabbing the bottle um, but if i try doing lifting this bottle up with my wrist flat or with my wrist into flexor mode right here or extension mode okay so i got you guys can all try this at home too so if you guys can see my video keep your wrist very flat like this okay just like this now, what I want you to do is extend your wrist without using any of your muscles besides the extension. So now you're just going to extend. You see how your fingers go down naturally? They don't stay out, but they start to go down. A lot of our patients who have spasticity can start to use this to their advantage. So now when they need to lift, lift something, for example, their phone, they can come over their phone and then go like that. And it tightens it up. So this is a way a lot of our patients in physical therapy and occupational therapy learn how to use this grip so that they can pick up forks and spoons and feed themselves. So this is essentially the cool part about physical medicine rehab is that you're, you're, you're using things that you normally would think are dysfunctions, but using them to your advantage. So I really just wanted to show you guys that. Okay, there we go. So labs, okay. So uh, Temple Nero was gonna monitor her anti-seizure medication level. So whenever you're on a seizure medication level, you have to make sure you have an appropriate uh, amount of that drug in your blood and body. Radiology, again, we really didn't get to look at it that much. Um, this is something that neurology was following with. Um, so 2016, 17, and 19, she pretty much got like MRIs. And essentially they just showed, um, you know, the stroke pattern in her brain. Okay, so differential diagnosis, right? So like, what are we actually thinking about now um, to diagnose her with? So one, arterial venous malformation. Number two, the spasticity. Three, the hemiparesis. And those are it, right? So those are the main things that are probably causing a lot of her symptoms. And you can also put ambulatory dysfunction in there. Um, you could put uh, clonus elicited, you know, on exam, things like that. So let's talk about our assessment and plan for her now. So number one, let's, de let's, let's deal with the spasticity. So there, there, there are many ways to kind of treat spasticity, right? So one of them is using a muscle relaxer. Um, so you could use a systemic muscle relaxer such as baclofen. Um, now that's something if you take, it's gonna relax all your body systemically. The thing with her is that we don't wanna, we don't wanna give her an oral medication because her left wrist and arms, she's using that spasticity to her advantage. She's using that grip. She's able to use a cane and push off a chair with it. Um, so we don't wanna give her something systemic that weakens all her muscles. So what do we do instead in PMR? We actually use Botox. So a lot of people think Botox is just for cosmetics and wrinkles. So how does Botox work? Um, it essentially, if you get into the science of it, it inhibits your acetylcholine release, right? Which is good for muscle contraction. So essentially we're preventing the muscles from contracting. So if we give this to her in her calf muscles, then her foot will no longer go through that back and forth clonus, right? Because your calf muscle has to be the one contracting in order for that foot to go up and down. So as I mentioned, no systemic anti-spasticity medications. Because again, you have the potential side effect for unmasking even more weakness. And she also had some spasticity in her knee extensors so or her quadriceps, um, but we weren't really sure if that was contributing to her overall um, problem. And then after we do this Botox uh, injection, we can think about what do we want to do for bracing, right? Because once we give this injection, her foot's going to go completely um, limp, right? She won't be able to use her calf muscle to kind of bring it up or anything or put it even down. So what we can do is if my phone was an ankle orthotic, we can put a brace on the bottom of her foot that connects to her ankle and bring that foot up. So now she has a normal steppage gait or a normal gait. So the second issue with her, right, is her gait abnormalities, the way she's walking. 
So what do we do? We start physical therapy. This is um, the beauty of physical medicine and rehab is that it's a very team-based approach. It's very integrative. Physiatrists rarely just work by themselves. We really rely on physical therapists as well as occupational therapists and then speech therapists to really be part of the team and give their assessment and plan as well. So, so then you ask, well, what does a PM&R doctor do? And we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that with the questions, but we also medically manage, right? We have to understand Botox. We have to understand the medications and the drugs and come up with the assessment for how do we treat someone? So we are going to continue HEP, which is home exercise program, right? So we're going to give her home exercises to do to really just kind of keep her consistent. And then lastly, we have her hemiparesis we need to worry about. So we're going to give a wrist and a finger splint to keep her wrist neutral, okay? So hopefully we can give her something because right now her wrist is kind of just in that position. We can extend it out and really just keep it neutral there. Because the other thing is if you have spasticity and you don't really treat it, that can really lead to a contracture. And that means like a forever shortened muscle um, that really is just impossible to even bring back to like a normal lengthening of that muscle. And then we can consider extensor tenodesis bracing. So what is extensor tenodesis bracing? I have a video there, but the picture on top is pretty much where we would give the Botox. So you have the soleus, you have the gastrocnemius, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you would give some injections just right there focally. Um, and I'm, I'm not too sure how often she would need that, but patients would come back to get that done frequently, maybe three months, four months. And so here's a video of what a tenodesis splint is. So this is the other cool thing about PM&R is that, to get cool thing about PM&R is that we really use like biotech advancements, prosthetics, um, 3D printing, like artificial intelligence. This is all like being integrated right now with PM&R. And that's why it's such a hot field as well. A pincher grip that if I were a person with a spinal cord injury, I wouldn't be able to do without the orthosis. I also can change where it opens and closes with this little button right here. So just like we were talking about, you extend that wrist and the fingers come up. So this splint essentially helps you with those, with those movements. Um, it's just super cool, right? It's just like robotics and stuff. I have an it's, occupational it's therapist awesome. and Okay, so let's- Hey see. everybody. All right. So I'm a DO, I'm an osteopathic physician. So I'm always thinking about how can I help my patients with OMM, osteopathic manipulative medicine, right? So when we did an exam on her, we also noticed that she had really like tightened muscles and tonicity in her right paraspinal. So her muscles in the back that go down her spine were pretty tight. So what can you do for that? Something that a DO can do is called myofascial release. This is where the fascia is really tight and you really just need to massage your way um, and hold it until you really feel that release. And, you know, fascia we're starting to find more and more is the reason for why we get knots and these muscle dysfunctions. So key points to understand with OMM and musculoskeletal issues is that a lot of times patients and even me and even you guys, we all have compensation patterns that are misaligned. Um, so what does that exactly mean, compensation pattern? So if you, if you guys have ever seen like a tensegrity like structure, like one of those kinetic balls that you can open and close. Um, that's exactly what tensegrity is. So this is a structure and we all ask ourselves, how does this not fall? But it's perfectly balanced at every angle and the leverage is absolutely perfect that it can, you know, it, it can stand up. And that's the way our bodies are, right? So for those, of guys, for those of you guys that might do weightlifting out there or anything, if you ever do a squat, people might, you know, I, you, you can always get asked, what is the most important part of your squat, which body part. A lot of people think it's your hips and things, things like that up top. It's actually your ankles because if your ankles are weak, your knees become weak. And if your knees are weak, your hips become weak, right? And you can keep going up the chain. If your hips become weak, your shoulders become weak, your shoulder becomes weak, your neck becomes weak. And there's this compensation pattern where if your left side droops and the next part, your right side gets messed up, which means the next side, your left side, and it keeps going. So all of us have these compensation patterns to some extent. Okay, so furthermore about the discussion here about spasticity and clonus, right? So spasticity, right? So I already mentioned, it's an upper motor neuron lesion, right? And it decreases inhibition, right? So there's too much activation of the muscle, which uh, causes it to contract, causes local activation of those muscle spindles. There's a disruptive communication between the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and there's like a negative feedback system of these muscle spindles and alpha, alpha motor neurons. 
I know that I'm, I'm not trying to go over your head guys, but um, this is basically just, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but. And then clonus, right? So spasticity is just tone and clonus is that next level back and forth flexion extension, right? So the alpha motor neurons here are too activated. And the, the, there's an increase in the sensitivity of those muscle spindles. And again, there's loss of inhibition from the, all these different uh, spinal tracts that you guys learn about in medical school. And again, another, another uh, pathway that we can talk about here where there's excitation actually. So there's excitation and there's inhibition going back and forth. So hemiplegic gait, okay. So an extensor synergy pattern. So oftentimes when you have a stroke, you, you, can, you can develop a synergy pattern. Have you guys ever seen patients where their arms might be like this flexed and their arms are like this when they're in the stroke and they're laying in bed or they're extended out like that or their legs are kind of flexed? That's essentially a synergy pattern. And so what we saw in this patient was an extensor synergy pattern. Her knee was extended, right? So it was straight out. Her ankle was plantar flex, which means, you know, like think about pushing the gas pedal down, inversion, so towards the midline of her body. And her hip was actually also extended. So it was jutting outwards. She had a decreased step length, right? So whenever she was walking um, in, a, in a hemiplegic gait, you don't take a normal step of let's say three feet <clears throat> you might take one foot and then she had your so in a hemiplegic gait you're supposed to have a reduced gait speed you're not supposed to walk that fast because you're not able to but what did we learn about the history of, of her she sometimes says she's a fast walker and can be clumsy at times so what do we learn when you're walking that fast and your foot is constantly hitting the ground that quickly and remember in her gait the front of her foot was touching the floor every time first so she kept activating her calves and that's what caused that trembling and clonus in her. So how do we treat that for her? So many in a hemiplegic gait, we would give an ankle foot orthotic. And again, if somebody's foot is down and this was this brace that you're seeing, they would just push it back up. So other things we really have to think about is understanding functionality, right? So it's always important to assess functional, uh, the functional workings in a patient's lives. Right, so in this patient, she always said she's rushed. She, the, the way she talks, she's always seemed anxious. She walked fast. Everything was hurry, hurry, hurry for her. And then you have to think about the psychosocial aspects, right? So this is the art of medicine here. She's 21 years old. She has a strong sense of social acceptability and ego, right? This is kind of that, if you guys are psych majors or minors, you guys know at different stages of, you know, different ages, you go through different stages, right? So at 21 years old, the ego really starts to form uh, to be solid. And then you have a strong sense of social acceptability. So what does that mean? So if we gave her an orthotic, if we gave her just something to wear for her ankle, is she actually gonna wear it? Especially if she's trying to go back to school, what would her friends say? Would they make fun of her? You know, she also wasn't using any assistive device before this. So that's something we gotta got to talk about with her because she would like to go back to school. And then we gotta think about the, her overall health, right? So we can't just only solely think about MSK, neuro, and figuring out these gait issues, but also looking at diet, looking at physical activity, looking at sedentary lifestyle. These are all factors that play a role in this patient's health, especially if she has a left hemiparesis. You know, it's gonna to be tough for her to exercise. Maybe there's days where she doesn't wanna walk at all or she's in pain. So if she's not having a great diet and all she does is become sedentary, well, you know, that can lead to obesity, right? And I think in medicine, we always tend to think about what's wrong, right? What's wrong with a patient? How do we fix it? What do we do? What do we do? But we often, or we seldom look at what is working well. What are the, what are, what are the positives we're seeing in a patient? So the, the, the main thing that jumped out to me with this patient is the rapport she had with the doctors. She was engaged. She really listened to them. She talked to them. She was open. She wasn't hiding anything. Um, and so this is very, very important, right? When you have a patient, you want to educate them, you want to influence them in certain ways so that they can become compliant. What else does that mean? She's likely to not miss visits. So now that she's looking forward to talking to these doctors, she'll come back in two months, you know, or three months for those follow-up appointments. She's also motivated. She's 21. She wants to go back to school. She's on path to achieving appropriate level of a cognition, right? So she had a stroke. That's something we worry about. <clears throat> is saying, man, is she, is she still learning? Does she have any learning disabilities? And for her, it doesn't, did not seem like that, which really helps for taking care of herself, right? 
And that's it, guys. Um, these are just the references I have, but essentially that, um, how do I unshare here? Oh, stop share. That's essentially the case I have for you guys. I mean, uh, hopefully you guys learned a little bit about PM&R, some of the things that maybe you guys might not have known as, or who, who, who the heck are PM&R doctors and what do they do? That's essentially a great case that really assesses functionality in a patient and how we can really see what's wrong with a patient and treat them so that they can go back and live functional lives and an optimal life. So I think at this point now, uh, am I gonna look at the chat to get the questions um, or should we just keep it physical medicine rehab related? However we wanna do this works with me. Hi, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. We learned so much from you. It was an honor to have you as a guest speaker. Everyone make sure you go check him out on his socials. So yeah, um, well. we've sent over some of the questions that we were seeing a lot or some of the most prominent ones during the okay. live. And we gotcha. can continue sending them in. So guys, if you have any questions, please go ahead and send some in. And then we'll send them over to him to answer. Yeah, so I'll just start here. So it says, what hospital are you doing re residency at? I'm actually at Penn State Hershey. Um, and I'm doing all four of my years here. I'm doing my prelim here, prelim year here. So I'm an intern here. And then I'll do my three years here as well for physical medicine rehab. Where's the most interesting case you've seen? Oh, that's it. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, I've seen, I've seen th this case was actually very interesting for me just being in the PM&R field. Um, I've also seen very interesting GI cases. I've seen a guy with mid gut volvulus at like the age of 45 and having Crohn's, um, which is very rare. Um, I, one of my patients was the oldest living survivor of Lay syndrome, which is a disease where only like six people in the world have. Um, so that was, you know, interesting to see such a rare mitochondrial disease. And, you know, this guy was like 30 some years old and usually you die before the age of five with Lay syndrome. So that was very interesting. Uh, why do you, uh, why did you choose DO over MD? Great question. I didn't, um, DO was the only school I got into. So I went. Um, but so I did get MD interviews. Um, I was waitlisted by an MD school, um, just never came to fruition. And honestly, if I'm being honest with myself, I probably would have chosen an MD over a DO at the time because I thought about the stigma or whatever. The MD school that I was waitlisted at was Geisinger, which was closer to my home. I'm from right outside Philly. But the biggest blessing in disguise was going DO and being able to use OMM to my advantage and like being very good at musculoskeletal and going into PM&R. So like, I'm super happy I went DO. I'm super happy with the holistic mindset. Um, it's really worked out for me. Do genetics play a role in aneurysms? I think they can. So like Ehlers-Danlos or some like collagen elastic diseases can make you prone to aneurysm. So it definitely can play a role. Um, you know, I'm not sure what exact genetics there might be, but there are certain diseases that can make you more prone to these things. What's the difference between PM&R and a physical occupational therapist? That's a great question. So if we have a patient who comes in with a spinal cord injury, right? He has a gunshot wound to the back. He's no longer functional in the legs. What do we have to do, right? So obviously we have to get him to walk again. We have to get him to eat again. We have to get him functional to live his life. That's where occupational therapy and, function, uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy come to help. But what if this patient's blood pressure goes so high that they have an emergency? What if they are not able to urinate or they're incontinent, they urinate too much? Who's gonna manage that, right? And that's where you need a physician to manage, right? So PM&R doctors also medically manage their patients. So we're looking at the patient in a medical perspective saying, okay, is this patient urinating fine? Are they having bowel movements? Um, things, things about the stroke. It's all about the medicine behind it, but then we're also assessing how can this patient do well in physical therapy? So it's almost like we are referring our patients to physical therapy, to occupational therapy. So when you work at a rehab unit, uh, you know, they usually, the patients usually have to do like about three hours of exercise per day, physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, and then we kind of see them in the morning, just like you would if you were an internal medicine doctor. So what was my major in college? Um, so I was a biology major because I was kind of forced to. I was in a seven-year med program, actually, at Temple University. Um, unfortunately, I didn't make it through. Got a 3.48 GPA instead of the 3.5 that I needed. But I say unfortunately, but actually super fortunate I didn't get in. Um, I had a two-year gap year, but I was a bio major to answer your question. We can kind of get into all the my medical school journey with other questions. But my biggest advice here is 
I wouldn't, if I could go back, I would have majored in like econ or computer science or like just something so random that I might've still been interested in. The reason I say that is kind of twofold. One, it's the last time you'll ever in your life kind of get to just do a deep dive into a subject um, and just learn about it. Two, you're going to do science for like the rest of your life, right? If you, if you end up going into medicine, you're practicing medicine for 50 years, you're going to be slaving away doing sciences for the rest of your life. And then three, none of those classes, honestly, in undergrad help with med school besides maybe like anatomy and physio. So I just, I don't think it's worth my money and time to do a science major where I can just minor in it, get the prereqs, but then also enjoy college and learn something that, hey, you never know how we can come back and help you. I'm very entrepreneurial mindset now, and I wish I had a business background to really just understand economics, stock market, accounting, finance, all that different stuff. It, it, it really would have helped me now. What are some PM&R fellowships? Yeah, so there, I, I like to break it down into inpatient fellowships and outpatient fellowships. So inpatient, you can do a fellowship in spinal cord injury, brain injury, stroke, pediatrics, cancer rehab, which is kind of a mix of both. And then outpatient, a lot of people choose to do sports medicine, pain medicine with anesthesia, um, sports and spine, which is like interventional um, spine uh, procedures. I'm thinking of going into musculoskeletal regenerative medicine. So dealing with things like stem cells, PRP, um, interventional orthobiologics. But then you can also do things like um, a movement disorder specialist. You can be a neuromuscular special tip specialist. You can be someone who just does EMGs and just does procedures with that. So there's so many different things you can do in PM&R. And I think that's the reason why I was so attracted to the field is that you can really combine all the, the different things you want and kind of just create your own practice, create your own field. There's so many options to PM&R because of that. Uh, what was your reason for pursuing a career in medicine? Yeah. So I don't think I really truly understood or understood the answer to this until probably like last week or, you know, like four weeks ago when I, when I go on my Instagram lives, um, I've always, I've always believed that knowledge is ecstasy, right? Like, don't you guys just love that feeling whenever you learn something like new and cool and you're like, wow, like that aha moment where you're just like, man, I never knew that. So I was always seeking that as like a young kid or like growing up, I just always loved that kind of stuff. And then the other side of it too was like, I was always an athlete growing up. So I've always had a, had a predilection for um, exercise physiology, weightlifting, musculoskeletal kind of stuff. But the biggest thing was like, I was always looking for a mentor growing up, you know? And a lot of my mentors were kind of like in the books I read or YouTube videos, watching like motivational speeches, things like that, like philosophy. And I've always like told myself, I love to teach. I really love to teach. I really love to mentor. And I think medicine's the perfect field where you can kind of just combine all those different things. Um, and then going into a field like PM&R where I would, I'm going to feel like a life coach or a mentor to my patients where, you know, I can really be side by side with them as they go through this journey of trying to walk again or just trying to become functional. You know, a lot of the accidents that happen, they don't ask for it. Um, so it's a, it's a very challenging time for these patients and just having that privilege to be with them and take them through that journey, you know, is, is such an awesome feeling. But essentially medicine, because I mean, it's, it's a whole combination of things, but I think it really boils down to the fact that I love to teach, I love mentoring. You're always growing and learning in medicine. Um, and I've always heard this, and, and I've, I've heard this quote when I was applying for med schools, um, it's by Robert too, and he says, don't be afraid to walk away from something that no longer grows you, serves you, or makes you happy. And when I really think about that, medicine's that one field that, you know, will always grow you and me or grow my patients, grow me, myself. It'll always serve my patients. It'll serve me as well. And then it will always make me happy and hopefully my patients. So that's honestly the reason why I chose it. Um, could you talk about your story behind the BSMD program? Yeah, sure. So when I was in high school, I was actually pre-dental. So I applied to the BSDDS program at Temple University, got into their seven-year dental program. I realized I didn't just want to approach with oral care. So I wanted a more, you know, holistic, full body, functional medicine approach. So I asked the advisor, hey, can I switch over to the BSMD? She said, yeah, that's fine. My stats were okay enough to do that. Um, so essentially like, I just didn't know how to study properly. Like I did very well in high school. And then I just bombed college because I just didn't understand how to do well. Granted, Temple's a very hard school, um, but essentially I didn't get in. So I had to take two gap years. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of BSMD programs. I'll, I'll mention that. And the reason why is I think 
no one at the age of 16, 17, or 18 really truly know that they want to do medicine, myself included. Um, I don't think, because I think often at 17, 18, when we go pre-med, we tend to blind ourselves only to medicine, right? And we don't look at other fields. And that's another reason why I say major in something else. Follow your passions. Be interested in a bunch of different things. And in the end, if you still choose medicine, <clears throat> awesome. But now at least you can extract different qualities and different lessons from different fields that will only make you a better human and a better doctor. So I think it's always important to keep your options open. Even if you want to do medicine, you can still do those prereqs and everything. And again, if you fall back to medicine, even awesome, or even, even, even better. Um, I told myself I want to do medicine at 16, 17. I honestly don't know if I did. I think I realized that during my gap years is where I was like, no, I think this is what I want to do. But that's why it was so crucial for me to have those gap years to really just mentally mature my mind um, and be ready for med school. Uh, what age groups do you usually work with? Um, anyone. I mean, uh, most of my Instagram followers are from like 18 to 35. Um, again, if you guys, I don't know if I'll get through all these questions here. So if you guys, I do respond to everyone personally on Instagram. My handle is at Dr. Darsh. It's D-O-C-T-O-R spelled out dot Darsh, D-A-R-S-H. Go ahead and message me. Um, I do a lot of like perspective, life, book reviews, medicine, my life in medicine, all those different types of posts on there. Um, so you can check that out. But then again, please message me. Like I'm more than happy to talk to you guys and give advice about anything. Doesn't even have to be medicine, medicine related. I do a lot of functional, like biohacking, uh, functional medicine, diet, workouts, all that stuff too. Um, do you do any surgical work? So no. So when I chose what I wanted to go into, so usually they say you either choose surgery or clinical, or if you like both kind of something in the, in the middle, I like eliminated surgery right off the bat. I just didn't want the lifestyle. Um, I also have a bad back. I didn't think I could stand for like seven, eight hours. Um, it's just, it's a grueling career and a lot of people do it, but I also don't think it was the best way that I can make my impact on the world, on medicine. Um, so I chose to go the clinical pathway and then I found PMNR. What are some tips you can give to pre-meds? Um, so that's, that's some of them right now. I would, I would recommend <clears throat> diversifying your experiences, recommend finding a commitment, like a long-term leadership position. So when you really look at what med school is, med school is an up and down journey, right? It's a roller coaster. And so when they look at your application, they're also looking for things that show that. And that's why I think gap years are so important because now you're able to take a year or two and do an activity for that long, endure the failures, endure the hardships, but also show your improvement and show how you developed yourself. Because that's essentially what med school is going to be like. What is your experience doing PM&R inpatient uh, or in outpatient versus inpatient, different types of patients? Yeah. Um, inpatients mainly like traumatic, right? So traumatic brain injury, spinal cord, stroke. 75% uh, of PM and R uh, residents go into outpatient. I love outpatient. Um, I actually did enjoy spinal cord as well. So I mean, I'm going to keep an open mind as well, but I'm leaning towards outpatient. Um, yeah, the, the, the patient population is different um, in outpatient. So, you know, they're more ambulatory, they can walk, things like that. Um, whereas inpatient, you're really, really trying to make them functional. Do you think biomedical engineering is a good major for pre-med? I know you can major in anything, but is it a good foundation for medical school? Nothing's a good foundation for medical school. Honestly, the biggest foundation you can have for medical school is up here, honing your mentality, personally developing yourself, learning your strengths and weaknesses, um, and just trying to become a better version of yourself each and every day. That mentality will carry over into med school. I don't think anything honestly will other than that. Um, so if you're passionate in biomed engineering, then definitely go for it. Do you have advice for those who are taking gap years during this time? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So it's obviously tough, right? Because there's not much you can do. But I would say try to create something if you can, right? So you, you definitely have the strength that no one else has, right? You're definitely a master at something that nobody else is. Everybody's a master at something. You need to figure out what that is. And then you need to figure out a way to share it with the world whether it's through social media or share it with your community, share it with your family and write about that experience, write about it on your med school apps. Um, so I like, I think personally on like on a personal note, that's what you got to do. You know, you got to create something or just really share something with the world. Other things you can do. I mean, there's things like this, right? Web shadowers, which is awesome. You know, where you can really get shadowing exposure, learning about different fields, put this all on your application. I also have cases on my Instagram TV. I have about 15 to 20 hours worth of clinical cases where I just teach everything from the patient coming in to the patient leaving, everything we're doing, the labs, why do doctors do this? Why do doctors do that? Uh, and, the, and, the, and the gray area of medicine. So you can check that out as well. It counts as a med school activity. 
So I would really do these different types of things. Also maybe like Coursera or edX, getting a certificate in like a leadership course or, you know, just kind of branching out and showing med schools like, hey, I'm trying even though I'm kind of locked in quarantine, right? Uh, who's your biggest mentor or inspiration through undergrad and med school? Honestly, I can't think of a single person. I think, you know, if, if I could talk about people from the past, Leonardo da Vinci is like, he's like the guy that I read about the most and like I try to emulate, right? Like this guy is a genius. He could do so many things. He was always improving till the day he died. Um, so like, that's the one guy I would say that like really kind of inspired me with his work ethic and the way he lived life. Um, but there was no one, no real person that I can think of that, you know, was a, was a mentor to me. And that's why, honestly, I love mentoring other people because I want to be that person without somebody going and reaching out to them saying, Hey, can you mentor me? Because medicine can be a very intimidating field, but I think now with the advent of social media, Instagram, TikTok, I think a lot of you guys can really see the way we live now and understand that, Hey, <laughs> Darsh isn't that scary. Like he doesn't bite. I, I can, I can message him. And absolutely, like you can message me, I'll, I'll respond. So I think having that now is such a huge advantage because um, I know back about like six years ago, you know, when I was applying, it wasn't that common to have so many med influencers, right? Uh, what characteristics are important for doctors to have? I think one, not being able to take things personally, like living in the present moment, not getting too anxious in the future, not holding on to the past, but kind of just being free flowing. Medicine's a very grueling field in that sense where you can really hold on to something very quick and that can be the end of your day. An attending can yell at you for, you know, making a dumb mistake. You can either hold on to that or you can let it go and learn from it, right? So being very resilient and adapt, uh, yeah, adaptable to like different scenarios, that's very important. I think Co communication is very important as well. Your ability to speak and your ability to pick up on nonverbal cues, nonverbal language, things like that um, is very important. One for patient education and also just like, would you work with a team? That, that's very important. And then third, I would say being inquisitive, having um, a mindset where you love to Google things, right? Like if somebody asks you something, you don't, the, the first thing you do is not just ask them, but you Google it yourself. You can't find out, then you ask, right? So always asking questions, but always trying to learn things on the daily um, will, will really help. Uh, what does a work week or a day look like for you? And how many hours do you typically spend at the hospital? So currently I'm in my intern year. So I'm pretty much doing like one year of internal medicine. Um, so like right now I'm on um, internal medicine wards. So essentially it's like anywhere from 10 to 12 hours. Uh, you know, I get to the hospital by like 6.30. I round on patients, myself, come up with some plans. Then we round as a team for like two, three hours. We come back, we put in orders on the computer. We type in our notes. We take care of any pages, things like that. And then if you're on call, admissions start to roll in from the uh, ED. And so you essentially have to, you know, admit those patients, write up a note, come up with a plan. And that can take some time. So it really depends on what rotation you're on during my intern year. The most I've worked so far is probably like 84 hours in a week. Um, the least I've worked is probably been like not long at all, maybe like 40 hours or like 35 hours on some of the easy rotations where you're able to get out early. So it really depends. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially a day in, in, as an intern. Now, when I go to physical medicine rehab, it's gonna be very different. Um, there's not much rounding. It's a little bit more chill. Um, the medical emergencies can still be there, but they're not as frequent. Um, so it's a little bit more of a relaxed uh, day. And then you also get more outpatient, of course, in physical medicine rehab, which is more structured rather than the inpatient where you're kind of just figuring out what to do and you can get a surprise at any moment. So that's all the questions there. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for your time. We learned so much from you. Um, everyone, make sure you check him out on his socials and his Instagram TV cases. Additionally, thank you all for attending. The link to the Google form has been posted in the comments right now. Um, yeah. Please keep in mind yeah. you're responsible for tracking your own hours. We are just here to verify them when contacted to do so. The link is about to be up in the Instagram bio as well. For those of you who cannot copy and paste it from the comments, please remember there's 30 minutes to fill it out for us to receive verification of your attendance. We hope to see you all at our next session tomorrow at 2 p.m. EST.
again, thank you so much, Dr. Sean, everyone for showing up. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And it was a lot of fun. And again, guys, reach out to me on Instagram. It's completely fine. Message me um, before I message you. So um, happy to help anyone out there. Thanks for having me again. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Have a good day. You as well. Bye. Bye.